Hey, good uh, afternoon, everyone. It's 12 noon East Coast time. Carm Capriato. It is the Town Hall Academy. It is, let me see, what episode are we in? 231. And we're going to talk about playing the long game. You're coming, uh, we're, we're coming to you live from the Remarkable Results Radio Podcast Studio. If you're going to be with us, hanging out at all with social media, we'd love to have you check in with your city. Give us a like, a comment. And or a share that would be, be so nice. We're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn and YouTube today. Of course, we'll repurpose this next Thursday as a podcast. And as always, you can watch this on our YouTube channel. Love to do this for you each and every Friday at 12 noon. It's the industry's first ever and consistent single subject forum that's been likened to a 40 minute 20 group. And um, if you've not learned something today, gang, uh, you're about ready to always listen to learn just one thing. Um, look, we want to talk so thankfully uh, about our great sponsors that bring you this show. You know, every piece of paper you touch, it adds up to seconds, minutes, and hours of your staff's time. Get paper out of your business and unlock your employees' potential with Shopware's digital shop management software on the web at getshopware.com. And when someone searches for a shop, who are they finding? Is it your competitors? Well, it should be you. The good people over at Shop Marketing Pros know how to drive website traffic and make Google work for you on the web at shopmarketingpros.com. Hey, if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe, give the video a thumbs up, and thanks. Hey, everybody. I'd like to introduce my guests to you. Look at this panel, will you please look at this panel? Wow, Fred Guestwicky Jr. Do you use Jr. all the time, Fred? Yes, sir. There's three Fred Guestwickys in my county. My dad and my son are the other two, so it's very important to use the Jr. Ah, very good. Thank you. Jr. is it. Then fix it with Fred in Canton, Ohio. Boy, I'd always wanted to go to the NFL Hall of Fame. Hmm. Someday I'm a mile away, now. man. I'm a mile no away. Kidding. Is one mile. Yeah. If you're at the Hall of Fame and you break down auto repair near me, I show up. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you. Okay. Gilda Dykeman from Cars Automotive and Muffler, Redondo Beach, California, in business with her husband, Michael. Yes. Good morning. Hi, Gilda. Thanks for being here. Russ Thank Crosby you. from Russ's Ranch in Clinton, New Jersey. Hello, Russ. He's uh, stuck. Uh, yeah, Russ, Russ is having some problems. He seems to be frozen. Uh, Russ was in Town Hall Academy 224 with me a while back as we did comebacks, uh, talking about prevention, reputation, and cost. And look, we're here to talk about the long game. And uh, Fred, uh, I, I saw you give this presentation in Florida maybe, maybe two months ago. And uh, I, I was really moved by it. And, and, and I think the strategy behind that is that um, I guess the point of it all is, is that, hey, what did we do yesterday? And what can we, what, what can we learn about for it for today? And we don't really think about what it really means for tomorrow. Where are we going and how are we getting there? And sure enough, I believe some of the things that we do shape our future, but not all the things that we do because we have to. And, and I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a believer, Fred and Gilda, in reinvention all the time. So I, I do want to uh, talk about this long game. And, and there's a bunch of things that we need to talk about. Technician, mindset, customers. And, and I've got so many more things that I continue to think about. Succession, training, technology, recruitment, specialization. Those are all, if in my mind, those proof of concept long games that we have to pay attention to. Uh, let's pick technicians for both uh, Fred and Gilda. Uh, Fred. What's the long game for technicians with you? Technicians, I, I can't tell you how many times I've spoken with shop owners. I'll post on Facebook where people are like, where are you having luck hiring techs? What website works best? And, and when I see that, I think, do you really think there's this obscure corner of the internet that all of the techs are there waiting and we just <laughs> haven't found the right site? Sure. The people with this incredible ability to hire technicians can't find technicians because they don't exist. They do not. They, they don't. And the way we can play the long game is you have to be growing a technician in your shop. You have to take somebody that is not a tech and give them the skills. What happens if they leave? There's another tech out in the industry that likes your business and can be a advocate. 
for potential hires. So the way we play the long game, we hire a tech every year. We have a, a couple local school programs being high school, adult education, college. And we bring one of those entry level techs in every year. We brought one in in August last year. He already grew to the point where he's almost a B tech. So we just brought an extern in and he started about two weeks ago. This gentleman is on fire. I anticipate that this 2021 could be the first year we hired two grow your own technicians in the same calendar year, Carm. We've never been able to take a tech, bring them in and get them on a path to a career and then bring a second one in in the same year. And the only way we're going to populate the world with technicians is by our master technicians passing yeah. those skills down to those young, young people that want to use their hands. Uh, Fred, Gilda, um, I, I'm hearing so many excuses. It's killing me. I am I get up on my soapbox about uh, apprenticing. And that if we were going to, there are so many official programs out there for apprenticing, real good, solid quality apprentice programs today. You'd be crazy not to have one. And no matter what you two are doing, the strategy about growing our own techs is the right move. But I keep hearing these excuses. Uh, I can't afford, I don't have any room. What do you say to someone who says that to you? Um, you know, it, it's really hard for young kids these days, um, you know, when they're at school, you know, high school level, you know, the counselors, they're all four-year universities, four-year universities, and that's all they have stuck in their head, you know, and so um, we're trying to mindset the young kids to, you know, because school is not for everybody in college, you know, it's the trade schools and um, trying to work with the counselors to open up that because there's no more in one in, in California and, and where we're at, there's no more shops, woodworking, automotive, you know, there's nothing like yeah. that anymore. You know, it's all about, you know, computers, engineering, you know, the higher level education. And so we're just trying to push our industry in, in our community as much as we can, you know, and finding the younger, you know, the younger, people that are out there um, not being able to move and grow in, in our industry and feeling stuck, you know? Um, so, um, and so we have master techs that we want that are here teaching our, our younger guys, you know, to further their education. And, and so, you know, so you're talking to, you're talking to a, a friend of yours and you, you got to do this is listen, I, my question was, I can't afford uh, to, to bring on somebody and, and I don't have any room to put them. Uh, but yet, uh, the minute they lose a tech and they need, they take eight or nine months to replace it and their business suffers for it, what do you say to them? I mean, is there, a, is there, a, you got to swallow, you, you got to grow a better business, you got to find the profitability, you got to find, I mean, you, there's a lot of things you got to do to make this happen. What do you say to someone? People get too focused on what's happening today. You said it right, Carm. They lose a tech. Oh, I need to hire a tech. We just went over that. There aren't techs. Mm -mm. You're looking to hire a purple unicorn with pink toenails. They don't have that. So instead of waiting until you need a tech to look for a tech, look when you're not ready to hire. And people say the same thing. Well, I can't keep somebody on a leash or there's not enough techs. If, what if you accidentally found a technician that was ready to join your team and you're out of space and you, what if you accidentally had too many techs? If you think about that mindset, now we're talking about the future where having too many techs means, oh, a shop across the street closed down. I can rent their building and open a satellite location. I can add on bays. People can be more efficient with the bays they have. There's somebody quits and you're not short staffed. There's so many ways that hiring now, looking today for a technician every day being today prevents you from having that regret that you're like, oh, I should have talked to that guy. I have three technicians I'm speaking to right now, and I am not hiring. I just added a tech two weeks ago. I have three technicians I'm talking to, and one of them is a young man that talked to me a year and a half, two years ago before he went into school, and he's a potential candidate for our next Grow Your Own. Gilda, what do you got with this? Um, exactly what Fred's saying. I mean, we, we've hired two um, extra techs because they came along, and we, we saw some potential. And actually, we had hired two. And um, 
a third one came like the day after we hired the two were like, come on board. I mean, we're heavy right now on techs, but that's the price we're paying to grow them. We saw potential walk in our door and was like, okay, I mean, we got to do what we got to do. You know, we'll be heavy for a while, you know, because our, our crew right now is getting older and they're, you know, yeah. they'll be retiring in a, in a five to 10 years. You know, uh, so you're investing, you're heavy right now. And there are, I think, just too many people unwilling to take that risk mm -hmm. of investing that money. And can you all three just say to that person, forget about it. It's the best thing you could invest in. Absolutely. Definitely. Well, and, and uh, how many posts and talks have you seen where people are complaining they have too many texts? Every None. single, yeah, every we single have, post is complaining. We have a whole group on Facebook just for hiring techs. There's companies that their job is to help you find techs to hire. There is no company that when you have too many techs, you can give them one of your techs to find a job. Because if you cut them loose on the market, they'll have a job within an hour. So I have a girlfriend who's a headhunter and, you know, for other industry. And I go, well, let me call her and find out what are her strategies of finding people. And she goes, I have now I'm headhunting for technicians for you guys because they can't find them. And she goes, they just don't want to, you know, with the COVID and the unemployment, they just rather sit, you know, taking their unemployment and not working, you know? Um, so she says, it's really hard finding technicians for us, you know? So it's, it's across the board. Headhunters are looking for them. We're looking for them. So it's so crazy. Don't there. wait. Ba basically don't wait and sit on the sidelines, Russ, and, and say, Oh, woe is me. Uh, be proactive, be aggressive. Uh, we've done shows on this. Uh, the homeschooling association apparently has a lot of great young people that mo mo might not necessarily want to go to college. Their parents may not want them to go to college for reasons. And, and, and they're looking for a connection to the, young people that want to work with their hands. If it, it, we can't, we as an industry cannot sit on the sidelines to all of your points uh, for the long game. If we're going to, if we're going to survive and wait for someone to walk in, wait for a Facebook ad to click, maybe look for something on Craigslist, wait for one of these great internet companies that are trying to help us hire tax. We have to grow our own. That's the long game. The point of this show is the long game. We're talking about technicians right now. Russ, please chime in and welcome back. Yeah, sorry about that. We're they're doing a bunch of uh, of work on the lines here, and I, I dropped out there for a second. But so I am actually going through a situation right now where we're hiring another technician. It's a dealer tech, and look. You know, we know the golden rule, the people that we want are already in jobs. So we got to get out there and get those people that are already in jobs. So, uh, you know, something that's that isn't very settling to some of these these people is, you know, what if it doesn't work out? This guy's a, a master Audi Volkswagen technician. He wants to join our team. And I told him, look, this is a hot market right now. Why not give it an opportunity? You really want to work with us. If it doesn't work out, you're going to have a job in the next day. So don't be afraid to have those conversations with those guys. Like, look, it could really be a great thing or it may not work, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to help you find a spot that is going to work for you. And it really gives that potential new teammate, um, that that trust you're putting you're building trust with them immediately right out of the gate like hey i want the best for you i think our shop is the best for you but you don't have to worry because there's going to be something out there if this doesn't work out this it's not like there's there's a, a limited supply of opportunity out there for technicians as we've been discussing so when you have those conversations with those people that are that are comfortable where they're at don't be afraid to bring that up you know and that was a i think that was a turning point in the conversation with this gentleman i was talking about where he's going to take the chance and come on to our team and give it a shot you know what he brings up such a great point i'm sorry but i had not thought of that if it doesn't work out you could have a job tomorrow yep and meaning meaning if you're looking for the kind of culture <clears throat> the kind of work environment the kind of team and family that we are growing and building here this is the place I need your talent. You need this environment. You need this program. And if it doesn't work out between either of us, you can have a job tomorrow. I'll find you a job tomorrow. I have friends that are looking for talent like you. Mm. 
I want to reinforce, Russ, I did exactly what you just said with the candidate, pre got him in a team interview, and our team interview actually uncovered the guy didn't have enough accountability to match our team. So now he wants in. I don't want him. So I know several local shop owners. If you don't know that, if you don't know your rivals, get to know them, become friends with them because they will help you. And I knew a shop that this guy would fit. Mm -hmm. And I referred him directly to the owner and the owner hired him. So now I have a shop, a, a technician in the industry that I did not hire, that I left right. him with a good taste in his mouth. So when the guy next to him is like, I'm applying at this place, fix it with Fred. What is that? That dude's unreal because they helped me get this yep. job. Yeah, you got to be ready to fulfill what Russ said. If you tell them you can get a job anywhere, you've got to be ready to do what you said. And I did it and I do not regret it at all because I know that man will be thankful to me for a period of time. And if he intersects with another tech, I'll have word on the street that's positive. And I also really like the what you said, Russ, because um, people get stuck in their everyday life and they don't they're afraid to take that chance they get stuck in their comfort zone you know and and they they're afraid what's out there you know and and they get they they work for the same company year after year after year and they don't know what's out there what's different you know um at fix of fred you know or cars automotive you know they don't know what culture's out there you know and they're almost brainwashed not to leave you know <clears throat> Any final make, thoughts on this segment, guys? Like you just said, um, and Carm, you remember from my presentation, fear prevents you from going into a new world of greatness. People habitually follow what they know, what they do, what they're comfortable with. And changing positions isn't comfortable, but it's what it takes to get better. Yeah. Um, and, and acknowledge that. Like Russ said, I know it's scary. You get on here, what's the worst thing could happen? It doesn't work out. You can go get another job anywhere. So that's all I had to add, Carm. A wonderful stuff. Hey, look at I. I want to take a, a quick time out. Thanks to Stacy and Mike and Kip and Joe and Hans, uh, who are joining us. And of course, we'll repurpose this uh, next Thursday as a podcast that you can listen to while you are mobile. Uh, I want to come back and I want to talk a little bit about the future of repairs and and, and technology. And then in segment C, I want to talk a little bit about the long game for customers. But in the meantime. So much thanks to Shopware. You know, when was the last time you heard a customer say, thanks for taking my money? Get Shopware's shop management software and your customers will be shouting it from the rooftops in overwhelming five-star reviews. Learn more at getshopware.com. And you know, your customers want you to do what you say you're going to do. And it should be the same with your marketing company. Shop marketing pros, they listen and care and they quickly respond uh, to do what they say they'll do for you on the web at shopmarketingpros.com. Great conversation. Thank you all so much for being here. We're talking about the long game here on the Town Hall Academy. Uh, okay, you got to be in EVs and hybrids. I mean, you can't, this isn't disc brakes are going to go away. This isn't HEI is going to go away. This isn't all this stuff is going to go away. This is here to stay. Don't shake off technology. Don't do this stuff. And so when is the day that hybrids will be a critical piece and then the evolution to EVs if they're not already? So let's let's tear this one apart, guys. I think there I think it's already here. I think the time is now, right? We need to start that training immediately and really start pushing towards the the future that's already here. I, you know, here in New Jersey, I think one in every 10 cars I see is a Tesla. So it's happening, right? And if we're not ahead of the curve, we're going to fall behind it very quickly. So, you know, my team and I have really started to put together a plan on training for for these new EV vehicles. And it's a hot topic right now, right? So if you want to if you want to get out there in marketing and start saying, look, we can handle this type of work, not only are you attracting new clientele, but you're attracting new technicians, because that's what they want to work on. These people coming into the industry now, they want to get after that new EV lifestyle. This is what we like to work on. It's clean. It's cool. It's sexy. Let's let's do this. This is what I want to work on. So you're not only attracting new, new customers, but you're also attracting that new talent. You know, <clears throat> the day came where we had someone walk in the door with a hybrid. 
and they said, do you service hybrid vehicles? I had to say no to that one time. And I realized this isn't going to go away. I believe I read in 2020, it was over 3% of all the cars sold in the United States were hybrid and electric. And that number is going to go up as time goes on. Um, imagine a world where your car doesn't have a consumable fuel. Your car doesn't have as many fluids or filters. Yes, that's scary. But we instantly went to a training. We had to get everybody trained where we've already this year in our wonderful town of Canton, Ohio, that's known for one thing. I've had <laughs> three hybrid vehicles with the hybrid system broke in 2021 that we fixed and put back on the road. And we are the only shop that's independent that does hybrid repairs. So when the shop up the street has to say, oh, no, we don't hybrid. We don't repair those. We don't repair those. The day's going to come where he's, they're going to go, oh, man, we should learn those. Meanwhile, right. shops like us that are playing the long game, that are looking at that future going, I need to get ready for that now. We're welcoming those customers in. Yep. Those customers that their hybrid went out of bumper to bumper warranty. And they're like, I'm not going to the dealer anymore. Where can I go? You want to be that stop. You want to be that shop. Yeah, that that happened to us uh, several years ago, and and we said, um, yeah, we we we'll work on them, and it was a learning curve at that moment, and so you know, and that's where we went and got some more training on it, and so we have a couple of our guards and our guys in our in our shop that uh, feel comfortable enough to work on them, but I think it's also educating the customers because they think those cars just keep going, keep going, keep going. And then they don't do anything about it. They think, Oh, it's a, it's, you know, it's a hybrid. I don't have to do anything to it. And then all of a sudden they come in and I'm like, Oh, you mean I still have to do this to them? You know, the brakes and I'm like, yeah, of course, you know? So it's like, it's a foreign language or a foreign country. Come on. Yeah. Wait a minute. Uh, how could someone be that blind to it? But anyway, I won't get up on myself. <laughs> Well, and, and with those hybrids and plugins and electrics, we have to be ready. Um, this is something you heard me share in my presentation, Carm. I'm going to have to be able to offer customers a fill up. We're going to become more than just fix the car. We're going to have to offer vacuuming, detailing, recharge my car. And if anyone hasn't looked into what it takes to put in a charging port, look into what it takes to put in a charging port. Because at my shop, my breaker panel is maxed out. It's cheaper for me to drop a second electric service at my building than it is to redo my electric system to have the capacity. And I'm glad I did that homework now because I'm just listening to those customers. And when they offer, do you offer fill up service? They have it at the airport. They have it at the park and ride. Some of the parking lots even have it. So we need to be ready to just make that phone call and know how much it's going to cost so we can offer those amenities that those hybrid and EV customers are looking for. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Judy Zimmerman, a, a great friend, been on the show a lot, Zimmerman's Automotive. Uh, they're putting in a charging station, uh, I think, out front of their place. And I, I think I did a little research. Those aren't inexpensive, I guess. they're. But I also believe that government may come in and, and do some subsidizing on that. Did anyone hear anything about that? I, I believe that there's there's talk about the uh, the fast charge stations that the government is going to be doing some subsidizing on that. But I really, you got to take a look at your infrastructure around you too, to make sure you can handle that. Yeah. Um, but I think I think this could be a great thing for us because that may force local municipalities and government to start creating better infrastructure for our our local businesses. So it's pretty exciting. And I wanted to touch on something Fred was going to say or said before, you know, um, not to bring up covid right but we all got very creative during covid on how we're going to better service our customers so now that we have these ev vehicles coming out and it's becoming a, a prominent conversation piece in all in the automotive industry we need to again step up our game and figure out how are we going to better service our customers what amenities are we going to offer them like fred said and there's a lot, there's a lot there, right? It's not just, uh, you know, we're going to charge it or we're going to rotate your tires. There's a lot to that vehicle that we can do. So I think, I think as an industry, we really need to step up our game on what can we do? Take apart, take apart that vehicle and say, what do we want to give our customers and how, how can we do that? What can we give them? And I think uh, that will, that will open up our eyes a little bit more and not be so afraid of bringing these vehicles into our shop. And guys, as the landscape changes, you're going to need those EV and hybrid customers in your database 
because even though they may have, especially the EVs may have less work on them, you're not, you may not have the average ticket that you're enjoying today. You need, you need thousands of more customers in the database to support right. a profitable shop of the future. And, and, and to me, if you don't start today, uh, again, it's one of those things where in five or six or eight years, you're going to wake up and say, woe is me, what happened? Right. By Finn that time, heard, you're left in the dust. Get, get left behind. All the shops that aren't preparing for this, this is part of thinning the herd. They're going to look up. It's going to be too late. And yes, there's going to be less visits per year, but there's going to be less independent shops offering service for those visits. So it will balance out where we will be busier. We'll have more cars because there'll be less shops to choose from. One guy dies from fixing a hybrid or electric while they're working on it, and the whole landscape of working on hybrids will change when you see a YouTube video of somebody on fire. And I mean, we're in California. So um, in Los Angeles area, there's everybody has at least one hybrid or one EV car in their family. And so it's just, you know, they're going to, they're going to find somebody that's going to work on it and move on and they're going to work on all their cars. So, you, you know, you need to get, be prepared, you know, cause you're just going to lose not just their, their hybrid or their EV car, you're going to lose, you know, their gas car too. That's a great point. There's so yeah. like, you, you forget that these people are dabbling in buying these EV vehicles, but I think what's the average, it's two and a half cars per household in, in the United States. So you bring in that one person, it's just, it's, it's easier for them to deal with one location. So you're yeah. going to get those vehicles that you didn't have before. Hey guys, uh, we're, I'm going to take a break. We'll go into segment uh, uh, C here in a minute, but uh, I'm going to be doing an interview soon with the with a gentleman in a partnership group that are putting up EV only shops. Hmm. EV only. So I already had a pre call with him. Uh, he's a smart guy, trainer, uh, and started the place in a place you would never imagine, Nova Scotia. <laughs> and the discussion that I had with him that I know we haven't recorded the episode yet was I said, what if you went to Montreal or even Toronto? He says, oh, my God, we that's what we're we're growing toward because of the amount. Again, the concentration just put in all EV shop. My one of my points was to ask you all specialization. OK, the Euro shops and, you know, how I, I talked to uh, Scott. Uh, Scott Brown from Cardinal Shell. I think you probably know Scott. He's he's in your group, and he uh, put in his business to business technology center, and, and that's a, a, if you will, it's specialization to do for shops the things that they are unwilling to invest in or have the training to do. And I think an all EV shop one day. Although you have, a, have to have tons and tons and tons of customers to support it, you need to be in a market that supports that. But I always say this, what, what do we know tissue as? We always say, do you have a Kleenex? Does everybody know that in the analogy between Kleenex and tissue? Tissue is the product, Kleenex is the brand, but we turned around and took the brand and we call the brand what it is. It right. says, hey, anyone have a Kleenex? Like a Band-Aid. It could be a puff. Like pork yeah. roll yeah. from New it Jersey. Be, I have a, does anyone have a Kleenex? No, I have a puff. You can't have it if you just want Kleenex. <laughs> so the point is, is if you're going to do all EVs and you start that brand, you start that name, it's like, it's like a Redondo Beach hybrid service. Everybody is rebranding their hybrid service so that when someone goes to the web and they type hybrid repair near me, you've got that connection. What a fabulous concept for marketing. And if that's not playing the long game, I don't know what it is. Yeah. Oh, cool. Hey, I'm, I'm excited about this. I can't wait to go. We're going to come back. And we're going to talk about uh, the fact that we need the most important part of our business is that customer experience. Let's talk about when we get back the, the long game for customer experience. Um, hey, digital communication makes it easy for your customers to understand the value that you're providing when you fix their car. You'll feel appreciated. Your staff will feel appreciated. And most importantly, you'll sell the work to pay the bills. Great software. Get shopware.com. 
And if you realize that your marketing looks exactly the same as the shop down the road, well, your shop's different and it deserves marketing that is as unique as your shop is. Let Shop Marketing Pros show your community just how different you are on the web at shopmarketingpros.com. FYI, you guys are just on fire together here. I just <laughs> I just want to give you a high five and a compliment. We we're gonna have to come back and either do part two or something else because you're 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 clicking in in a great way. Uh, the long game on customers. Uh, if we don't have the right experience, we don't have repeat, and we don't have a sustainable business. This one is really really big because. Shop owners get stuck on the money subject, the topic of how high is that bill? You know, ooh, $4,000 job. And I'm like, is it their first time? Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't really want a first time customer to spend $4,000. <laughs> I don't. I want the 4000 bucks, but I don't want the customer to do it. And I actually told a customer this on Monday. I told a customer outright, I don't want your vehicle to cost you 4000 bucks. And they're like, but you would want the money. I'm like, no, I would rather you have a $500 visit times the rest of your driving career. That money sounds much more attractive to me than 4,000 bucks. When they, you ask them for an oil change, you're like, oh, that shop's expensive. No, your car broke. So the long game is, is looking at total lifetime spent, looking at a customer's personal ARO. That's something that we look at is what is that customer's ARO? How much do they spend? And if they've been there once and their ARO is 4,000 bucks, give them a free oil change or something to get them to know that it's not 4,000 bucks every time they come in your shop. Yep. Cleaning somebody's clock, that's the hard, and it's not our fault specifically that they car broke down because their fuel pump went out and their shop they've gone to hasn't done an inspection in two years. So you pick it up, it needs all the brakes, all the tires, a front end, an alignment, and a fuel pump. Yep. You're four or five grand. You're just doing your job. Yep. Um, so telling the customer, I don't need you to spend all this money at once. I'd rather just like change your oil and put a couple filters in it or change your oil and do some breaks and just voicing that, that that's your motivator to a customer. I was so stunned. I, it was a new customer. I'm like, well, we're seeing, I already think they're not going to come back because they're spending four grand and it's hard to get over that. But telling them they were blown away. They, they were completely blown away that our motivation wasn't today. Our motivation was your whole driving career. But your motivation was safety and reliability, number one. I mean, they, they don't want to spend that kind of money, uh, but you're there to solve their problems, not to fix their car. Correct. Yes, service industry, not repair industry. Yeah, and, 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 and I, I love what you said. I would love to stretch that discussion on the communication side. You know, are we over communicating, under communicating? You know, your your heart went out to them. It says, "Listen, I don't, I don't need you to be a brand new customer to spend that kind of money. I want you to come in here. I want you to keep your car lots and lots of miles. If you become our customer, you come back, and we do what we want to do for you. You're never, you're, you're probably going to have a whole lot less invested per visit. How are we telling people that, Gilda? Yes, definitely. We, I mean, we started years, many years ago, and we were the re, in the repair business, and and now we've switched. You know, many years ago, that we are here to to have your you safe on the road. You know, we're here for them. You know, so their life is not crazy. You know, give it to us. We'll we'll do the craziness, but we want you safe out there for your customers. You know, for for their everyday life. You know, they don't need a, a wrench put in their day, you know, and break down. So, you know, we are always constantly, let's keep it running. Let's keep the long haul, you know, um, like Fred said, you know, we had a customer in, you know, last, last Friday and his bill was $9,000 and it was all maintenance. And it was his previous repair shop just changed oil. And that's all he did. Never recommended anything. And we was like, we can do this in pieces, you know, let's bring it back to part. He goes, no, no, let's do it all. I, I want to be safe, you know, and that was, you know, how we presented it to him, you know, so. I think um, another aspect to this playing the long game with your customers is really letting them know what your mission is in owning a business, right? Our, in my shop, and I believe in, in my, uh, my, my friends here on, on uh, the show, you know, our passion is really helping people. And when you really teach your customers, hey, look, 
when you're investing in your car, you're also investing in your community. You're investing in the, the your kids' little league softball team. You're investing in all of these other things that you don't typically think about. Let your customers know that that's who you are and that's what you do as a company because I feel like their kids are going to continue to play local sports. They're going to be involved in, in many different things. Families are involved with local charities and things like that. So when your customers know what you're actually doing behind the scenes and the uh, the repair business or service business is really just a vehicle to help the community in a better way. I don't think there's a better way to really lock on to that person in a very deep, meaningful way. And they're going to want to come back and spend that money with you because they know where it's going in the end. It's not just lining our pockets. It's putting flowers in the community and making the place that they live a, a, a better place to live. And, you know, helping their kids out and helping those that need help. So I think that's a huge part in playing the long game with your customers, just telling them what you're actually doing as a, as a business, as a community. And when you go to talk to these customers about the long game of their vehicle, ask them how long they plan on keeping their car. That's the thing we yeah. skip. What's your plan? I have a customer that's here today that owns three vehicles and there's only two drivers because they inherited a vehicle and the vehicle they have here today, based off their inspection results, they're like, you know what? We are now going to drive this car and change the oil until it blows up. Like we're not fixing anything else. It's our spare car. And now we know that car is no longer part of this long game plan. Right. Our advice can change. So when we see that car, we can go, okay, this is what's going to end this car. It's time to sell it. And then the other two cars we get to maintain for 200,000 miles. You don't always want to push that super long plan, that long-term plan, because the customer might be like, I'm going to look at cars this weekend. Yeah. And then you get an opportunity to like, let me be a part of helping you pick that next car. I want to help prevent you from picking a car that when you bring it to me for an oil change, it's going to need a bunch of stuff every time. Let me be a part of that decision-making process for your family because I'm a professional on cars and I know what cars suck and what cars don't. I want to help you pick a car that's going to do what you want it to. And when you have that open conversation, you're locking them to you for life. You're telling them you care. You're offering to be a part of their team, not them against you, right. them with you. Guys, is the only way that this strategy, the long game on, on working with customers, communicating with them to the degree you're talking about, uh, is the culture of the business the, 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 the baseline for this to work? Because I'm asking that question. I think I know the answer. But there's again, let's talk about the naysayers or the people that are on the fence. And this is Fred. This is great. Ross Gilded. Thanks. But how do I get started to have a relationship like that with my customer? Would the first question be, does your customer trust you? And if not, why? So I, when I'm listening to Fred a moment ago, I, I had this kind of epiphany, right? Like we need to put ourselves in the mindset of a financial advisor. We are, an, we are a service advisor, but we're a financial advisor. We need to look out for what's best for them and their investment. And if, if what, you know, if what Fred was, you know, the example he gave, this person's not really going to put any money into this car. Okay, now I can advise you in a way that really speaks to you, right? And in, in a way that you want you want your your life to to proceed with this vehicle. So I think that if you if you really put yourself in that mindset of, you know, you're you're their financial advisor, you're there, right. you're advising them on what to do. Now they're going to feel more comfortable, and you're going to build a really deep bonded trust. When they're going to sense that mindset, they're going to sense that you're not after their wallet, you're after their well-being. And when yes. people can tell you're giving them that good advice, it's so much easier to maintain that trust. Right. It's just asking the questions and and knowing where they're at with that car. I mean, I mean, you can't make the assumptions that they're not going to fix anything or um, they're not going to spend the money. It's you know everybody has a passion for something and it, it, it could be their grandma's car or their dad's first car. And yeah, I'm going to put whatever it's going to take to keep that car running for the rest of my life and my kid's life, you know, so you have to have that open communication, hearing the clues that they're saying about, you know, their life, their cars, their family, and know where, you know, 
where their mindset is. So then we're at the same level of, you know, of their vehicles. It's, it's you just open communication. All right. So uh, I did ask that, that made a comment on the importance of the culture in your business that, you know, again, seeps back out to your customer, but uh, and, and we could go on for another 40 minutes on that. And maybe we should have you come back and talk about the long game of culture. Okay. One day we could just do the whole, whole <laughs> show on that. This is a good Russ, too. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 oh, I just lost my train of thought, Russ. Oh, oh OMG. You were, you were talking about, um, oh, community. Yep. Uh, so important. Are we putting up our trophies and our plaques? You know, the, the, the news articles in our, in our showrooms, in our lobbies, are we including him in Facebook? Are we, what are we doing to be sure that people understand we're a pillar? And if we're not a pillar of our community, shame on you. I think I think sometimes we get wrapped up in our own heads that if we put those those trophies up or those those news articles or those clippings, it's almost like um, like we feel guilty about putting those things up. Like we shouldn't. We're like we're bragging about what we're trying to do for the community. But here's the thing your customers want to know that you're doing these things for the community. And if you're doing Facebook live videos and you're marketing that, thank your customers for helping you to achieve this because it's through them that you're able to get this yeah. done. Yeah. You know, I think all of us started our business at some point to really help people. We're in the business of helping people. And when you can embody other people to help you on that mission, thank them. Get them involved. Let them feel proud about what they're investing in, because as yeah. much as they're investing in their vehicle, they're investing in us to make the right decisions and help our community. So be proud of those things that you that you get and and show them off, but show them off in a way that your your people should be very proud. And I think that you have to do things that speak to you, that you're passionate about, you know, th that gets you in the heart and they're doing it for all the good reasons, not because you know, I want to put that plaque in my showroom and I want to put the clippings on in, you know, on the coffee table. No, you got to do it because you want to do it. You feel, you know, there's, there's a purpose why you do it, you know. Russ, I felt exactly like you said, and I still struggle with that. I'm very active with so many things and I have trouble bragging about it. That's how I see it. And thinking of it the way you said has helped me. Uh, and when I hesitate, I just pick a random customer that's walking through and just ask them, hey, you know, last week I was helping the Cub Scouts have a Pinewood Derby and da, da, da. Do you think I should put that on social media? A total stranger. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, you should. And then <laughs> I hear the customer's voice. I literally hear it. But I, want, I just want to reinforce what you're saying about not wanting to show off. I am the guy that has that exact feeling. Well, and I think another thing, too, is – by you talking about what you're doing for your community, you're inspiring people that you may never meet to do more for their communities. So by not telling people that you're doing this is really a disservice to those that were on the fence about getting involved with something. So don't, yeah. don't, yeah. don't take that away from them. Be the inspiration and the light they need to right. step up and get involved in their communities. I was Absolutely. recently down in, in Maryland at Dynamic Automotive, their 25th anniversary, and I toured three of their shops. And in every place, there are, there's, if you will, the wall of community fame. And there's even, you know, those curio type trophy cases in glass where anything that was ever given to them because of their community outreach was there. And if there was an article done on them, they got it laminated and it's up on a wall. And every one of the locations doesn't matter which community it was out of the five locations, they all share in community as a whole. And it's amazing how people come out and the, and, and the mayors and you know, all the, the, the people that are the, the chamber of commerce people, they're, they're all out in support of this great company and uh, they have family culture, they have community culture and it is a marriage. It is a bond. And, and I'm really glad I'm really glad we brought that up. I think that's something that we just don't pay enough attention to. And I love the the strategy, guys, is uh, I couldn't do this without you. The way why we're giving back to our community is because we have great customers like you. And what's wrong with saying that in a live or, a, a, you know, in a, in a typed ad on Facebook just by promoting the fact that uh, you know, we got this classic car on here. And, you know, and again, this is another reason why. 
uh, why we, we give back to the community. Uh, yeah, this was great. I so enjoyed this. You guys sounded good. You clicked and it was great. And so maybe we have to do this again. And I know you can pick three three additional topics so we can talk about the long <laughs> game. Uh, so glad to have Gilda Dykeman from Cars Automotive and Muffler, Redondo Beach, California, in business with her husband, Michael, for many, many years. Russ uh, Crosby is with us from Russ's Wrench Auto Repair, Clinton, New Jersey. And Fred, thank you for bringing us this great topic. And, you know, I met you for the first time down in Florida about a month and a half ago now, I think. Uh, Fred Guestwicky Jr. Fix it with Fred. <laughs> Canton, Ohio. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for Have a great me. 4th of July, everybody. Yeah, everybody be, be safe. safe.